to start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today we have amazing opportunity to meet uh, 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 Steven Windmill, uh, CEO of Everest Assets Group. And today we, uh, talk, we will talk about uh, leadership, uh, how to be a good leader. And uh, Steven, uh, can you tell me about uh, yourself, a little bit your background? Well, it probably be easier if I go straight into my presentation because the, uh, the next slide gives a summary of my background and I'll talk around that. Okay, so to talk a little bit about myself, um, I won't read through the biography there, but I've had an interesting career is probably the best way of describing it in that from probably my late 20s, early 30s, I realized that I was able and desired to be in a leadership position. And almost the instant that I, I made that decision, things started to happen around me. So I was already an army officer and the general that I was working for liked some stuff that I was doing and he got me onto a course. I then spent the next nine months feeling that I'd absolutely was failing that course and was calling up my now ex-wife at the time and saying, I'm failing, I'm not working as hard as anybody else. And out of the 200 people on the course, I came first. Um, another story later on in these, this presentation series, if we get to do more of them, I'll explain that particular point. But over the, the following decade, um, having made the decision that I wanted to be in a senior leadership position, I was repeatedly given them. Because as soon as anybody shows willing to take responsibility to achieve something, the seniors were very happy to allow somebody that's a willing volunteer to take control. And over the years, um, I managed an 18.6 billion pound change program, which involved just under 25,000 people across 51 locations, I think it was. And I merged them all together into a way that saved four and a half billion pounds a year. Um, in another arena, I was involved with advising businesses across pretty much the whole of the UK, um, excluding Scotland. But and in another arena, having thought I'd retired from the army back in well, about just over a decade ago now, um, I was on my way to a, a meeting and the postman gave me a little brown envelope, which in essence said, Stephen, get your butt out to Baghdad, you've got just over a week. And I got out to Baghdad and discovered that I was the head of plans for General David Petraeus and his 300,000 um, personnel. And I also discovered that I was working a lot with the Iraqi Prime Minister and I ended up commanding all 200,000 of the Iraqi military personnel. That's Army, Navy, Air Force. Navy is a bit generous, they only had one boat. Um, Army, Navy, Air Force, the C Central Intelligence Agency, National Police and Border Police. About 200,000 people all up. Um, it all came about because I made that decision that I wanted to be recognized from my skills and take a leadership position. That's me. Anna, do you mind if I go on to the next slides? It's interesting for me, judge in military courts, uh, uh, a little bit tell me what judge in military court. Oh, very interesting. Well, in, in the military courts, in one case I had I'm not sure I should go into the detail, but I ended up sending one man to prison for 13 years and another man to prison for six years. Cool. Um, most of the cases were relatively trivial, like non-payments of debt and um, going absent without leave. But some of them were more serious, involving assault, battery, rape, 
um, and coming up with a decision as the judge which satisfied both the law and my own concepts of justice and honor. I had a, I have a question of the concepts. Um, what drives you, what passion drives you every day behind your job? And what you justify within yourself, what's the justice values based on your passion are driving you through every day? Because from what I heard is people's lives might depend on you when you lead them. Uh, what, what passion drives you through, you through your actions? The very simplistic answer, putting my military hat on, is I, I took an oath as a youth aged just not just before my 19th birthday i took an oath to obey the orders of the queen and the generals and officers set over me and my own personal code of conduct doesn't allow me to break with those oaths once made that's one part of it a second part is Actually, I became extremely irritated by having seniors above me who were making crap decisions. They clearly couldn't manage or direct or lead somebody out of a wet paper bag. Their leadership skills are you know, approaching that of a peanut. And that irritated me. And on the basis that I could do better, aged now about, I don't know, 22, 23, I set myself the task of proving that. And then at, at a point where I decided to do an MBA, which I, I think certainly Anna can um, understand, I made the decision to do the MBA because I wanted to be knowledgeable, no, sorry, rephrase, more knowledgeable across the breadth and depth of running a business or, or any other organization. It's, it's, it's a high values that you're presenting. That's wonderful to see. Uh, by, um, uh, I, I, I personally admire that, the, the passion for the duty and for serving higher costs to other people. I, in terms of a leader, I'm here personally as a student learning leadership right now. Uh, I'm, I'm still looking for more from my heart, but the knowledge that I'm doing is not just for everyone, but also partly for myself. And how did that help to, uh, how did that um, came in your way, the connection to the higher good through, through your duty? That's a very long story. In summary, when I was very young and went, first went to school, I was the only person in my class who could read. And the teachers put me off into the corridor with a cupboard full of books and left me alone pretty much most of the time. And I read a book series um, I'll mention it here, which was called Biggles, which is about a, a young man who's in the, the military flying planes and doing honourable stuff during the First World War. And reading a series of books, and there's about 20 of the books in the series, and bear in mind I'm only four and a half, five years old, reading those books probably shaped my entire personality. I developed, I became aware of such a thing as a code of conduct and well, I pretty much accepted such a code at the age of five and have continued to follow it since. If I give my word, I will, follow, I will do it, which is why I very rarely give my word, unless I believe I can and will do it. Well, that's a wonderful introduction. We hope to hear more, more from the presentation.
Thank you, Stephen. I think that we can continue presentation or presentation. Okay. Why do we need leaders? Um, I must stop saying, um, we need leaders and one can argue that we are genetically programmed to seek a leader, somebody to look up to. And I've seen several papers on this that the young seek their, the guidance of their parents, that teenagers and people nowadays into their 20s, 30s are looking for people that can guide and shape how their energies and behaviours should be. And as they get older, so we're now looking at 30s and 40s onwards, it's people looking then start look to assume those leadership positions themselves. And we as a society need leaders to generate change. And at this point, I will differentiate the difference between leadership and management. Leadership is about taking people down a new path, an untried path that others have not followed before, cannot follow, cannot travel unassisted, or even have failed to travel in the past. Managers, differentiating between leadership and managers, managers follow the rules and behaviours and the criteria set by leaders. So the difference between a manager is somebody who looks after resources and the people under them. They chivy and motivate and organise the people under them, but in accordance with a series of directions, policies, structures that others have generated. A leader decides the direction that the policy is going to take people. And we need that now to generate change in companies, in societies, in groups of any sort. Excuse me just a moment. Um, and that's because society is changing and needs to change. We have Brexit which is creating massive change to business and society. Freedom of movement, human rights. The UK is about to, uh, in January, the UK will be abolishing the Human Rights Act. And at present, there's nothing to replace it. Trade, how we trade, where we trade, the ability to trade even, is being changed by Brexit. COVID, COVID-19 is changing the way that we all work. This seminar is being done completely online with every participant operating in a different location. Nothing wrong with that at all. But only a year ago, we would probably have met to have done this, as I've done on, on other areas. And of course, we have, um, if we think of Porter's five forces, we have political, economic, social, technical, legal, environmental, actually I've got beyond the five, but if we look at the forces that shape social and economic development, they are revolving quite rapidly and therefore following existing paths don't change, sorry, must change because the existing paths are for an environment that is unaffected by the political, economic, social, technical, legal and environmental stuff which are shaping the way that we make decisions and the way that we behave. And we need leaders. And given the speed of change from Brexit and Covid, we need extreme leaders. People that are prepared to step up and make a difference now. Leadership comes of physiologically, there is no phys no difference between any one of us and pretty much anybody else that we meet in the street. The difference is in the small matter of the words that we use. 
but there's also 38% comes down of leadership comes down to the tone of voice. How tonality, volume makes a difference to affect the way that other people will behave. And then there's body language. And body language is 55% of how we communicate. If you go to a country where you don't speak the language, you can still get across a huge amount of communication through sign language um, and various forms of body language, anger, distress, hunger. All of that can be easily communicated. It's body language, 55% of all communications. And the extreme leader, to a degree, can control all of those three key key factors. So the, the extreme leader communicates using a wide vocabulary. You cannot communicate as a leader if you don't understand the language. And I don't mean English, French, German, Russian, etc. I mean the emotional languages that other people use. So the extreme leader has to have a wide vocabulary. And yet that is only 7%. And developing a vocabulary can be time consuming, but it's not difficult. Tonality and body language, the other 93%, are more critical. They are the ones to use to be seen by others as a leader, even before one has said anything. I have what I call the oh shit moments. And I mean that quite deliberately because as you'll hear in, in a few, couple of minutes, Unless you take risk as a leader, you can't lead because otherwise, if you're not taking any risk, you're not taking anybody down a new path. All new paths contain a risk to some degree. Picture here is me back in 2008. I was heading out to Iraq and in one of the surrounding nations, actually, I forget which, I think it might be in the Oman, but I'm not sure. I was in all of them at one point. Um, I had to prepare a halo jump, a high altitude, low opening jump for covert operations. And was I scared? Bloody right I was. Did I do it again? Yes. And again, I did it three times. But that first time is a real oh shit moment in order to understand, and I, I use that because if you're not prepared to take a degree of risk, you really can't move forward as a leader. And more of that in a minute. Other people think the same thing. Jimmy Shea was the Olympic champion for the bobsleigh in, I think it was 2012. And he says the first time he went down that long, slippery, icy path doing, I think it's about 90 miles an hour on what's effectively a small tray. Um, scared him to bits. And then he did it again and again and again and ended up as an Olympic champion. That was his oh shit moment. Let me, I'll come back to that in a minute. But an extreme leader follows what I call REAP. You have to enjoy what you're doing. If you're not enjoying being in a leadership position, if you're not enjoying at some level the task that you're getting people to undertake, you'll fail. 
there is a huge amount of research on this particular topic. Energy. A leader, and in particular an extreme leader, if you're really looking to get out there and make big change happens or find very senior appointments, you have to have energy yourself. But more importantly, you have to generate energy in other people. And without that energy, if you can't generate energy, people aren't going to do anything. It really is as simple as that. And you have to inspire. The only thing I can consider it, it being called is audacity. That might be the wrong word, but this is. It's not following convention. Convention is ma is following a managerial structure, an existing process. It's not challenging any of the accepted ways of doing things, whether it's behavioral one on one, or whether it's to a group or to society as a whole. There has to be the agree of. I said I've called it audacity here, and actually Nigel Farage and. Boris Johnson, the current contemporaries in well, two, two major sort of political arenas. Or even. Um, it's not Biden. <laughs> um, Biden's the complete opposite of, of this, but audacity means people who say things and do things which are slightly unacceptable. Like Trump is probably the extreme end of being audacious in that he does stuff which is utterly over the top. But his audacity generates support for him. And I have to admire that. I don't admire a lot of what he does or how he does it. But the fact that he can get 70 million people voting to support what he does, despite the fact that the vast majority of them are now poorer than they were before he arrived is irrelevant. His audacity and the things that he says and the way that he does it. Uh, sorry, when I say about poorer, um, in I think it was 2018, he reduced tax, but he only actually reduced it, it, but he also took away the deductibles. So actually, although people are paying less tax, there are less things available for them to deduct. And as a consequence, people are actually slightly worse off. Um, it's the same with medical supplies. A lot of people believe that he has reduced the cost of um, pharmaceutical drugs across America. Actually, despite what he says, he took off a, I think it was 15%. He got all the manufacturers to take that 15% off. And in the following two years, there has been a 10% increase annually. People are now paying more for their pharmaceuticals than they were. But his audacity in saying what a great job he's done has carried people's 70 million people, which comes down to the proof. A great leader does what he says he's going to do, or what she says they're going to do. They provide proof that what they say is true and it will happen the way that they say they it will. So let me just ex expand that a little bit. Relish me. Keeping this commercial. Um, I thought I had a, a name of this. Somebody's statement I came across. If you can get commercially, if you can get the customer to love you, to really like being around you, to value your opinion or what you do, as this guy says here, you can blow up their building and they'll say accidents happen. Somewhere along the line, I've lost the name of the guy that did this. I think I'll have to re research that. Andy Preston who's described as the UK's leading sales motivational trainer. 
says he loves his customers and he does goes out of his way to serve them and make them happy he's not the leading sales trainer for no reason he gets results when he was a sales or he got results when he was a salesman he now trains sales men and women across the country to be selling more and to enjoy what they're doing as they do it um i love my customers written on the back of a card i picked up when i was out in boston steve jobs i'll read this one because as you probably are aware steve jobs had some huge peaks of success and some huge lows when his own board of directors voted him off of the board and effectively got rid of it. And he says, I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. The only way to be truly satisfied in life, I, I'm adding in, is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And this is a speech that he made at Stanford University in 2005, which I was privileged enough to be present at. Summation of that, one, that section. Generating energy. My belief this is probably the core, because if you can get people's eyes to light up with the plan, the vision that you've given them, their energy is yours. You don't need to supervise those people anymore. You don't need to manage them. They will expend their energy to achieve that vision that you have given them. Management, well, in fact, I've, I've taken this cartoon from um a storybook about accountants and on the left you can see that an accountant on his face you can see the thrill of victory and the, the agony of defeat accountants very are very rarely leaders they're backward looking um, and so on that is not leadership that is management victory and defeat become all much the same thing One of the leading coaches in leadership in the United States is Ike Bledstow. And he's described as the strong coach. And he talks about and trains people in how to develop an intensity and energy and type of energy that it needs people need to stay ahead competitively and to meet ever more ambitious goals. Without energy, nothing happens. I'm sure every, every guy has probably heard of Gillette. I don't know if Gillette make razors for women. Um, but Gillette claim their mission statement is we own the face. That's it, full stop. They own the face. And that is about razors, razor blades, rele rele the relevant creams and foams to make an easy shave. And the question I would ask if this was a, a larger group is why are we really here? Can't try to can't try to answer the question. Get the class to answer this question, please. It's yeah, for Anna, why are you here? Sorry, no, let's let's try the ladies. There's two of them. Uh, Stephen, uh, because uh, we uh, create this society and we want to, uh, you inspire us now and you uh, share your experience with us. That is why we are here. We we, we are really interesting this speech and it's absolutely new for me. Some topics. 
some topics I know, but something new, absolutely new. I think Ilya support me. Yes, Ilya. Oh yeah, for change and connectivity. And this is about well, it's understanding what you're trying to achieve. So you you're running this society for MBA students from Gloucester University and elsewhere. What do you hope the, the question you need to ask yourselves is why? Uh, my first I idea. Elizabeth, I, I, I won't ask Elizabeth unless, unless she wishes to chip in because she's here as a guest and she's shaking her head. So I'll take that as a no. Um, but the it's the higher meaning. Why are you here? And with that answer, one can come up with passionate reasons for supporting it. Yeah. Audacity. I touched on this earlier. And I can't think of a better way of expressing it. It's got to, it's boldness. It's a disregard for the normal social constraints or the normal organizational constraints to make stuff happen. And it requires a level of boldness and not just being arrogant, not being ignorant. It's being bold in pursuit of a vision, a goal, something that you wish to achieve, not just doing it for the sake of creating an argument. Bold and blatant disregard of the normal constraints around you. In order to change the world, the business, the group, society, whatever you choose for the better. Stan Hinmarsh, he owns, or well, he's a, um, the Hallmark Cards, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. He also owns the Hallmark Retirement Corporation, which has got rest homes and old age persons homes pretty much across the English speaking world. You may have them elsewhere now, but certainly in the English speaking world. And his comment is for his old people, his, his patients, his customers, when a old person's biggest risk is trying to get through the day without falling down, that's not a great life. So he encourages the old people in his homes to have a life. Picture here of them on a on a trike, two of them. Doing stuff, getting involved in the community. Entertaining themselves and others. It's about doing stuff. And he inspires energy in the people that go into his homes. And bear in mind, just go back to the trikes. Typically, people don't go into an old age person's home until they're probably in their 80s, certainly their late 70s. How many people of that sort of age do you know that would get onto a trike and go roaring down the motorway? Love it. And the same thing applies to customers, employees, markets, industries. If you can see a way of making a change for the better in some way, that is your leadership vision that you can one can inspire others to achieve. Which brings me round to proof. Do what you say you will do. It's back to sort of codes of conduct and personal beliefs, but a leader has to be believed. And that belief starts in the in their own minds. They can do something and they there's a good reason for doing it and they, they want to do it. And to quote Terry Pierce, who's a an American leadership coach. And I'll read this one out. There are many people who think they want to be matadors and fight fools. 
only to find themselves in the ring with 2,000 pounds of bull bearing down at them at 30 miles an hour. And that's the point they discover that they didn't want to really face the bull. They just wanted to wear tight trousers and hear the cloud applaud. There's a difference between you have to know what it is that you really want to do. And then your actions need to be congruent with it or people won't follow it. Do what you say you're going to do. Do I really want to do this? If the answer is yes, lead, motivate, make it happen. But if you're not really comfortable with what it is you're going to do, your followers or the people that may be your followers won't because they won't be, they won't feel it. As bringing this together now, the question asked to, to ask is, what can I do right now, regardless of what the hierarchy think, regardless of what my peers think, regardless of what my, uh, my juniors think, what can I do to make my piece of this world, my piece of this company, my place in the organization, what can I do to make things better? And once family. you've grasped that, you can start to make it happen. Sorry, uh, Elijah, you, you said something to say something? You were asking the question. I was trying to answer what exactly I can do is to fix my family. Look at my family. As you said at the beginning of the presentation, all the relationship and hierarchy is built through uh, the members we've been observing in our society. I think that's the starting point is all this family and uh, by learning family values and economic economical sorry uh, emotional part of the life through the family i think we can learn how to understand one another much better and through that deepest core of understanding that we are all one family here and we all have the bull facing us are we going to be together? Or... Yeah. And what can you, and the question to ask yourself, not looking for an answer, but the question to ask yourself is, what can you do? And then either do it yourself or what do you need to do to convince others to go down that path? That's it. Um, change the world. Yeah. There is physiologically no difference between, oh, I don't know, Trump, <sighs> Boris Johnson, myself, Putin, um, or the man outside in the garden sweep, sweeping the lawn. Yeah. Physiologically, there's no difference. It's all down to what you want to do and then setting in things in motion. And at that point, over to you guys for questions. Um, Thank you for amazing pr presentation, Stephen. And I want to ask you, we want to ask some question. What do you think, do we have a difference between a woman's leadership and uh, man leadership? Situationally dependent. There are situations where a woman may well be the best person to take a role. And in others, it may well be a man. In the majority of cases, it probably is no difference. But what about glass ceiling problem? I know in Japan, Japan, a woman cannot go to board of director and cannot be, become a CEO. What is the problem? Why, why man thinking that woman may be not, not so clever? Why is this difference? I can answer that in multiple ways. One is cultural. And every society has different cultural constraints. Cultural, the word is mores, M-O-R-E-S. And each cultural more are, they shape decisions, they shape behaviors. And the only way to bypass those 
forces that shape behaviors and expectations is to recognize them, understand them, and then move around them. But in Japan, as the example is, as you raise it, the culture doesn't allow chief executives to be female. And yet every single chief executive of an international firm in Japan travels abroad and works with and deals with female chief execs quite happily. So they know that women can be chief execs, but their cultural factors choose or shape their beliefs such that it's not going to happen around them unless they choose otherwise. But most people choose to follow or to accept the culture. They remain unaware of the culture that is shaping their own behaviors. And it takes a degree of mental, struggling for a word here, the men, met a degree of objectivity to see the forces around one and to be able to step outside of them. And very few people are able to do that. They allow themselves to be shaped rather than be one of the shapers. Wonderful. Uh, I've, just to add on an example of the uh, women's leadership, uh, it's just an observation which I had. For example, I've noticed that women are wonderful managers. Uh, so for example, Steve Jobs had a assistant, a wonderful assistant, without whom I don't think she would have got, got on far. Uh, it's like a woman sometimes can bring the comfort and this foundation for the man. And same as the manager manages the environment which the leader leads. I noticed myself that wonderful women have the potential to become most uh, strong and inspired managers. We started, we also, we started off with saying that leadership is not the same as management. I know, that's, that's correct. Stephen, give uh, give us some uh, please seven uh, K K point. Um, uh, what we should do, uh, especially then became a good leader. Maybe we should develop hard uh, or soft skills. Maybe you should develop our um, confidence. Give give us uh, young generation some. Um, Seven practical advice. Support and advices. I, well, Anna, you, you and I had a, a discussion on this topic earlier. I've already prepared a number of presentations which go down the route of identifying and developing the relevant soft skills in leadership. Um, there are probably three different core types of leaders. There are leaders who are appointed. So somebody is put in charge by somebody else. There are skill based leadership. So if you have skills in X. In a situation that demands those skills, it, it would and should be expected that you would take the lead. For instance, if a doctor, if, if somebody has a heart attack, um, stuck in a queue in the bank, and there's a doctor present, I would fully expect that doctor or nurse to take charge of the situation, and rightly too. Um, they have the skills, that, and they how they organise and look after that person and the, the environment around them is their skill set. If there was no such person, I would take charge because I've had a fairly significant amount of first aid training, um, not quite up to being a paramedic, but I, I can probably fix it you know, in the short term. I'll stop somebody from dying. Um, 
and if somebody else, if I wasn't there, I don't know. But it's situational leadership. And the third one is charismatic leadership. And charismatic leadership means there is something about somebody's personality that makes other people want to follow their lead. And that is probably the one that most people aspire to. And it's probably the one that is the most difficult to acquire because, and we're now into my beliefs rather than necessarily what I've studied, but I believe that unless you have a spark inside you, then that person yourself without that spark is unlikely to ever take a leadership role because first of all, they probably don't aspire to it. And secondly, even if they did, they make a complete hash of it because they wouldn't be believable. And I'm on fairly dodgy grounds with that comment, but the there has to be something that makes somebody wish to take a leadership role. And unless they've got that desire, it's not going to happen. But if they have got the desire, then they could probably fan that small spark into being the rabid charisma of somebody like a Donald Trump or a Boris Johnson. That's probably an extreme end, but you know, they've achieved very high leadership positions through charisma, not necessarily through leadership capabilities. And again, that's a conversation one in its own right. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Uh, I have another question, if I may. L last question, I'm getting very conscious of time. Okay. Uh, doesn't it seem sometimes, doesn't it feel sometimes that leaders could be seen as a kind of making this sacrifice towards the society? sacrificing themselves by leading that spark, as you mentioned, and setting yourself on fire of passion to charge and provide others. That, that's a, there's a definition of leadership there. There's the leader as a servant mm -hmm. versus the leader as a in the leadership role for themselves. So people who are in public life typically are leadership servants or the, the leader servant relationship they are looking to improve the society in some way and they're putting their own time and energy and lifespan into that achievement there are others who are achieve similar leadership positions who are in it have aspired for such roles because they wish to accumulate money or power or something for themselves. I'm not aware of a third one, so that's probably the only two descriptions I can, I can think of at the moment. I think in our times the world is a bit tired of second choice leaders and now... Yeah, you might be right on that one. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen, that you uh, work together with us and inspire us like leader and share your experience and uh, made our evening amazing. Very interesting information, very interesting, pr very good presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that next time we will invite you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you friends. Goodbye.